Thank you for listening to Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Buffalo What's Next is on summer break and we'll return with new content shortly. As we take this break, please continue to tune in to WBFO Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. and 9 p.m. for producer picks of some of our favorite episodes of Buffalo What's Next. How can we afford not to talk about race? About education. About segregation. About humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. On today's episode of Buffalo What's Next, Summertime Producer Picks, we highlight three segments from previous shows. Jay Moran talks to artist and entrepreneur Itina Farid Cook from February 22nd of this year. The two have an in-depth conversation about her upbringing and her media arts company, Get Focus Production. Then we continue with Bridget J. Povalenza speaking with a cool men's I do from August 26th of last year. The two discuss DEI, tokenism, equity, and ensuring that everyone has a seat at the table. And we end the show with Jay Moran speaking with Buffalo-based artist Julia Bottoms from January 25th of this year. First, we revisit Jay Moran's conversation with Itina Farid Cook from February 22nd of this year. On Buffalo What's Next, uh, back at Buffalo Arts Studio. And today, we are talking with Itina Farid Cook. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. First and foremost, uh, I want to uh, point out that uh, Itina's company is Get Focused Productions. We're going to talk a lot about that as we move through here, but there's a, a lot of different reasons why I wanted to get in touch with you because, Itina, you know, grew up here in Buffalo, you're a Buffalo artist, and you are in a lot of different things, music, film, all sorts of different elements. Just talk about how that all started. It all started um, from a space of, I would say, uncertainty first. Growing up and not being certain of self, but then getting opportunities that added value to who I am. Um, Growing up in foster care, um, having certain circumstances with labels, failure to thrive, um, diagnosed emotionally handicapped, and then getting opportunities to have or develop the language that I feel was in me um, that just had to be um, you know, pulled out. But I think it, it, it started there. It started as a young person going through the experiences that I go- went through and then just having this urge for more. Like life can't be about being a failure to thrive, it has to be yeah. more. Yeah, you know? I, the, the failure to thrive, you have that yeah. on your on your website, as a matter of yes. fact. It's all part of uh, about who you are. Yeah. Uh, where does that, I mean, was that somebody somebody said that to mm-hmm. you? Is it just kind of how you took what everybody yeah. around you was, was, was telling you? So, I was, <laughs> I'll date myself, I guess. I was born <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> um, and and I, I was in my uh, late 20s when in the oh 80s. So goodness, continue, yeah, right. All right, well, hey, <laughs> um, you know what? I th- I think that during that time frame, the foster care system developed these titles and labels that they felt made the most sense based off of circumstances. My biological mother, Laura Parker, had a an issue, substance abuse, and um, for whatever reason, she filled whatever void that was in her life with this substance abuse, which then affected her children, and we were taken away from her. And so a lot of times when you look at numbers and and words on a piece of paper and you're looking at children, um, you're trying to best identify what will be shaped from their circumstance. So if it was said that my, my mother was on drugs while I was in her womb, then you're deemed as um, back then, they called it a crack baby, unfortunate. Mm. unfortunately. That's not a label that anyone would like. That's nothing that I think they use in, in today's terms, right. but then that's kind of what they kind of, you know, created. Um, yeah. So when you have that right. and you look at those circumstances, most people, you know, intellectuals or what have you, and counselors and doctors, they assume that, okay, because of this, 
you're going to have issues. This child is going to have issues because of their inability to X, Y, and Z. And because her mother is this way, then she's going to end up like this. So she will be a failure to thrive due to being, you know, in the womb while drugs, you know, are being taken by her mother. She's going to be a failure to thrive because she's has these certain things that are going on. Her mother's not there. Um, you're placed in a foster care. You will not have an ability to kind of express yourself and your emotions are going to be out of order or what have you. Now, that doesn't feel good and doesn't sound good, but to most, you would think, yeah, this this is typically what happens, you know? Sure. Statistics show that most children who are in these circumstances will end up like this. The issue is, I don't believe that people, like maybe in those moments, they underestimated the power of community, they underestimated the power of mentorship, they underestimated the power and the value in education and the arts in collaboration with that. Because when I was exposed to that, Failure to thrive and emotionally handicapped faded away. That's interesting. And uh, if we could just maybe go back to best you understand. Absolutely. Like you said, I'll, I'll use the term and I'll try not to get back to it, but like a crack baby. <laughs> Was there, did you have any type of physical mental, emotional connection, anything that, that, that was something that you had to overcome? Or was it the label that you felt like you had to overcome? I feel like the label and perhaps some of the circumstances that were happening surrounding my upbringing, if you will, that added to that, um, that feeling of this must be true. I continuously got into trouble and always questioned myself, which is the same question for every adult, most adults that were around during that time, what is wrong with you? Hmm. And so that question would, you know, fly within my mind often what is wrong with me something must be wrong with me I'm not normal because I can't sit still or because when I am in contact with authority I have a problem you know so I must be a problem there must be a problem and no one can solve it not even myself at a young age this is what was going on in my mind mm. and you know that's going to lead to you know suicidal thoughts you know that's going to lead to you know this low self-esteem or looking in the mirror and not feeling like I want to exist and you know that's the narrative that I grew up with you know as a child as a little girl was there a time or th that you can recall that it went from being what is wrong with me to what's right with me. Or, I, I mean, it's, right. it, it, it seems like that, yes. that, 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 that switched for you. You know, there was a couple of moments um, that I remember. There's a lot of moments, but sure. one in particular was in my teens when I was, well, it was, it's, it's so many, but this particular one, when I went through a program at SEPA Gallery, um, Lauren Tent was the educator um, or the education director um, during that program and so we were capturing images with uh, disposable cameras and um, going through the development process with our images and I took this picture the thing about the photo is that I put thought into it you know this is the first time I said okay you know a creatively strategic like not kind of strategically planning this photo and I put my mind I'm like I want to do this I like how the shadows are and I put my all into it and when I developed that photo Lauren looked at it and said this is really good like you're really good at this and she decided to take that photo and use it for promotional purposes for the organization that's not the first moment but that's I'll a, never forget a, that's that a moment powerful moment for sure because what it did to me was maybe I'm not a failure to thrive what is this? Maybe I do, maybe there's something that I can do. Maybe I'm good at something, you know? And it was a lot of different moments where it was like grabbing hold to this kind of, this hope. Like maybe what they said was not true. Maybe there's something more. And, and I pursued that something more 
I constantly pursued that something more and I wanted more and then it became I wanted more just because I wanted more to I wanted more for myself and then it became I wanted more for my community it became I wanted more for the young people that surrounded me I wanted more for my neighborhood and just it just evolved into this like I'm going to get more you know and and sh you know shame on you know these labels that they place on on young people um because it, 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 you're holding them back. Why say failure to thrive? Why not say there's possibilities? If we do X, Y, and Z, there are possibilities for this young person. Why close the door? C failure to thrive is a door closed, you know? And thank God that I failed at trying to take my life mm -hmm. I was a failure to thrive in that circumstance but not a failure to thrive within my life and the, and the goals and achievements and um, accomplishments and what have you you know I Tina you're, you're, you're taking me down a wormhole here that I don't want to stop on but I do want to yes. I, I, yes. I, I, I most certainly want to get into get focused production mm -hmm. you know you read your website and now just mm -hmm. this time that we're sitting here together you can see that so much of what you do and get focused mm -hmm. comes from from this but let's i'll let you give us a generalization mm -hmm. of get focused and i want to also point people out to the website and spell it because it's get focused but focused is spelled with a k yes get focused productions give me an overview and then we'll kind of start breaking things down a little bit okay get focused is a creative arts media arts company that captures human first stories teach emerging artists how to utilize uh, their artistic abilities to tell stories not only emerging artists but other organizations and then we give back through you know showcasing videos on uh, different individuals within the community just highlighting uh, community leaders or what have you so in a nutshell we capture teach and give back capturing stories teaching others how to tell those stories in different ways and giving back to the community and we should also uh, mention, because I think it's very significant, that you are also a recording artist. Yes. You go by AI, the anomaly. Yes. Okay. Well, where where does that name <laughs> that that label <laughs> come from? So AI is the first two letters of my name. Right. Uh, when trying to develop this brand for who I wanted to be as an artist, I was trying to understand, like, okay, who am who am I? What am I trying to do? And so I had to really develop so that when you create a name, you don't want to sway too much far from that. When I think of my life, I am truly an anomaly. Um, anomaly is um, going against the rule. The rule of my life as, at a young age was that I would be a failure to thrive, that I would be part of the statistics, but I went against that rule or that label, and I'm outside of that. I'm, I'm living in this whole space that no one perhaps no one would have thought that I would be in, not even myself. Right. So I'm kind of living in this space of like, I'm, I'm, I'm a weirdo, I'm a nerd, <laughs> and I'm fine with that, you know? Absolutely. I'm all of the things creative, and I'm fine to live that life in that way. I've chosen to incorporate music into this art form of storytelling as well, and, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but the latest project that I that I worked on is Tales from the Porch. Right. And I've incorporated my music in that process. Tales from the Porch. Yes. Wow. Um, I encourage people to go. The easy way to find it is YouTube and, yeah, and go to Tales from the Porch and uh, probably get, yeah, focused, get focused on production. there as well. Um, the ones I was able to look at are just absolutely beautiful. Um, I guess maybe just, uh, why don't we just maybe give an overview, let, let you yeah. overview it and then we can break it down from there. Of course. Overview for me, Tales from the Porch. Tales from the Porch is a, a constant project giving voices to the community, um, minorities, and, you know, emerging artists, organizations, it's just not limited, limited to that, but um, just showcasing the community, the hope is always, everything that I do, the hope is to ignite thought and expand perspectives. So we're telling stories or allowing for uh, these individuals to tell their stories based off of their platform, their porch. The porch 
is this space that's not quite public and not quite private. Mm. It's a space that you would have to be invited to in order to experience, you know. So we captured these different stories of different people within the community um, in order to just showcase and highlight what they do for their community, their hearts and their passions um, from their porch perspective. And so the one that we just did last year focused on seven black leaders. Um, it was my response to what happened at mm. Tops. Okay. You know, um, I wanted to showcase individuals that I felt were doing the work. They've been doing the work. It wasn't new just because this thing happened. They were doing work for years, and they're going to continue to do the work. Um, it also came from my pastor, Pastor Stephen Foreman Sr., who in, in uh, the congregation he said, we must overcome evil with good, which is biblical. It's a biblical and I wanted to utilize my skill and my talent in order to showcase good. I wanted to focus on that. I didn't want to focus on the evil that occurred. Um, I wanted to focus on those individuals that were doing good. You're, you can reflect back. You're the young girl who grew up on Sherman Street, mm -hmm. and here you are right now. But you know this city. You know this city very well. What does Buffalo need? Oof. What does Buffalo need? God, faith, that's what I'd say. The fear of God, the development of faith, the ability to see others as human, to have empathy, to have grace. I think not only Buffalo, but this world needs that. You can't tell me that there's not a creator with all this creativity. And if we tap in and understand what is being said or what is being taught through that creator, who, you know, in my perspective, as God, we start to understand that, you know, all this time, all that was ever spoken about is agape love, unconditional love. When love is unconditional, I don't see you as white, black, Hispanic, or all of these titles and labels. I see you as human, I see you as me. If we can see each other as ourselves, we would move differently. If I treat you like I wanna be treated, let's think about that, right? If I treated you as you wanted to be treated, if I treated you with respect, if I treated you justly, equitably, if I listened and was active in that, if I, if, I wanted, if I seek first to understand, then to be understood, if I'm slow to anger, if I'm quick to listen, slow to speak, if I care enough about you, imagine all of us living that way. Is it complicated? Yes, because we're navigating through all of these hurdles of all of these different experiences that we had that shapes our perspective, that builds assumptions about each other, that creates these barriers and these mountains that we don't know how to push to the side and get to the end all be all, that you're just as human as me. I think that's what everybody needs, right? And what's wrong with that? It's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's not a thing wrong with that, you know, but it's not as simple as it said. You know, it takes time. And everybody needs to just do their thing and continue to showcase humanity. And this is how I choose to showcase it. And this is how I choose to live out the dash that's between life and death. That was Jade Moran with Itina Free Cook from February 22nd of this year. We continue with Bridget Jaipova Valenza as she speaks with a Kua Men's I Do from August 26th of last year. There are often conversations about representation mm -hmm. and what representation means to people of color, mm -hmm. to non-white people, simply and solely. How important is that? How important mm -hmm. is representation? I think representation is very important, right? We, we talk about some of these organizations that are doing this type of work or doing any type of work, right, from an industry perspective. But if you're 
in spaces, right? So I, I I'm coming from a healthcare background, um, mm-hmm. and so we serve people uh, in a in a healthcare need, right? And so if you're looking at that person and you don't have any frame of reference for what life they might live outside of your walls, you know, like the doctor's office or primary care, Mm -hmm. you're missing a really big component of how that person is coming in and how you might serve that person. And so a lot of organizations, I know, you know, we've talked about nonprofits that are doing work that are, you know, helping areas on Jefferson Avenue. If you don't have that frame of reference for how that person, their lived experience, you're doing a great disservice to those folks, right? And so I think, from a representation standpoint, in the DEI world, we talk often about best practices and mirroring the representation of your employees to where you you know you serve in that community, and that's a best practice. And it's because you're getting those different perspectives of folks that are coming from that lived experience. And so, without it, how are you informing the work that you're doing? You know, is that coming from your own internal interests, or is it coming from the community that exists? Um, and existed there probably before you got there in that community, right? Right. So it's really important to take that frame of reference uh, from a direct lived experience for sure. So, you know, one of the the questions that I I had really Mm -hmm. was some people can say that imagination versus representation Mm. is what's needed in order to see yourself Mm -hmm. or to to have empathy for another person that takes more imagination than it does representation. Mm-hmm. How, how would you respond to that? Empathy is something that I feel like innately we should have, right? We mm-hmm. should innately be concerned about other people, even if they don't look like you. So I would say that empathy is definitely something in this country we've been talking a lot about, right? How do you encourage people to have more empathy for people that might not look like them. But in terms of the representation component, it is oftentimes where people do have to imagine what that might look like because someone hasn't done it before. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of firsts that we're still celebrating. And sometimes people ask, well, why is this such a big deal that we're celebrating, you know, this first? The first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. Exactly, exactly. But representation in that, sense really matters because, you know, a young black woman looking at Justice Katandre, that's amazing, right? To see that someone has done it before and that you have a path of doing the same thing. And so it's representation. It's it's some imagination and just seeing that, hey, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Someone else has done it before. And even if someone hasn't done it before, saying this is the I have the will to be the first um, is really important for for folks. And part of that, too, is is exposure Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. education and really having that a a drive, that innate drive. Right. Um, But that really does come out of your education. Yeah. It does come out of the spaces where you're from. Right. Right. Um, And it really truly is difficult to have imagination if you're concerned that you don't have lunch today. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We always talk about what is it? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Um, And from a healthcare perspective too, we think about it from the social determinants of health perspective. Right. So we know that accessing healthcare or accessing a doctor is only about 20% of someone's total care. Mm -hmm. Things like transportation, education, economics, um, safety, and security within your own communities. Those are all important facets, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so it's only one component of a larger social and economic need that we need to be talking about for sure. Yeah. Let's go back to what corporations can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk to me about corporate culture. Yeah. And the importance of that, especially right now for people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, right now, millennials, the millennial uh, millennial generation is one of the largest in the workplace right now. There's about four to five different generations at any given point in time. But a lot of the conversations that we're having as it relates to culture is is the need for that to be the focus. Oftentimes people are like, oh, millennials and, and Generation Z, which is now entering the workplace as well, 
want the flexibility. They want the ability to work from anywhere, especially after the pandemic. Certainly. But what we've seen after looking at different surveying is the fact that culture is still number one for a lot of people. They want to belong to an organization that cares about them. The behaviors reflect the mission and values that organization stands on. And they want to make sure that they can thrive within that organization and, and bring more of their full selves to work. So culture is still number one in terms of what folks are looking at as it relates to making the decision of where they want to, you know, work. And certainly I think that, you know, people have choice. I mean, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. great resignation yeah. uh, has people changing jobs for maybe as, you know, not necessarily for more money. Right, right. But for a better work culture, better environment where they can thrive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we were talking earlier a little bit about um, racism Mm -hmm. and the difference between a a company having Mm anti-racists or just someone who is not a racist. And and there's a, a difference. There is. There is a difference. And I think... You know, in talking about it, one is more passive, um, but one is just more proactive, right? And so to be anti-racist, you have to be proactively combating some of those norms and status quo that existed prior to you having a focus on this, right? Right. And so to be proactive, that means that you're often anticipating some of the needs of, of the people that you're serving, of your own employees as well. What are the differences in terms of how people are showing up, right? I Mm -hmm. think even from a gender perspective, these are conversations that we're having is, you know, the curb cut effect is something that we often talk about as DEI practitioners. And it came out of the, um, you know, the ADA compliance realm where people talked about the curb cuts within sidewalks. And although people that were differently abled, it, it helped and benefited them, it benefited a lot of other folks as well. If you're pushing a stroller, that curb cut is, is helpful for it you. It is very right? helpful, yes. Um, I love to travel. My suitcase, pulling my suitcase, I can use that. People that are maybe, um, you know, taking things off a truck and rolling it into a store or whatever you have, it's useful for them too. So when you always solve for the people who, you know, have the most issues, Mm -hmm. it's going to help everybody. And I think from a racial perspective, we've seen that as well. Folks who are disenfranchised the most, um, if you're solving for their needs, everyone else is going to benefit as well. So I think that's the larger connection point. We all definitely have biases. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that informs how we move through the world, right. how we move through spaces. Talk to me about unconscious bias. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a brain, you have bias, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we're all born into it. And it's honestly how the brain works. There's different, like the frontal and um, temporal lobes in your brain produce stereotypes. And so we actively have to, um, you know, concern ourselves with how do we kind of work around those biases and how do we better inform ourselves um, to react and to act differently. And so I think first and foremost, just understanding that you have bias is the first step. Um, Secondly, it's doing a little bit more exploration and digging into what those biases might be. Um, Harvard has a great way of actually testing that with the Harvard Implicit Association test, Mm -hmm. where you can test things like gender bias or racial bias um, et cetera. But the awareness is is first and foremost, and then actively working against what those biases look like. A lot of conversations that I have with people, too, are questioning and auditing the own things, the, the very things that you take in. So your media, what media are you are you consuming? And does it showcase different people in a different way, right, that would maybe reinforce those biases that you might already have pre-existing. What books are you reading? Mm-hmm. Um, what what are you consuming? And and are there differences in what that might look like? And, and then actively going and looking for things that might not be in agreement with what you already might believe is, is, is a way to also, you know, attack some of those biases as well. That was Bridget J. Paul Valenza with A Cool Men's I Do from August 26th of last year. We'll be right back with our final segment of Buffalo What's Next right here on WBFO. How does music help and heal? Find out from our amazing guests on Mindful Music from Buffalo, Toronto Public Media. Join me, Carl Shallowhorn, Saturdays at 4 p.m. on WBFO, your NPR station. 
This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And we end the show with Jay Moran with Julia Bottoms for January 25th of this year. Julia, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. A uh, uh, real pleasure for sure. And uh, uh, great to be, actually be inside your studio here and looking at your work. Um, I'll, I'll let you just take us through just for a little bit because I'm sure you've had to explain this, a young artist. What? Tell me about your, your work. So how, how do you describe the work that I'm looking at around us right now? Well, the work is portraiture in nature, so it's always depicting people. But I like to think of it as storytelling, visual storytelling in a way. So I'm, I'm not just trying to get a likeness of a person. I'm really trying to make a statement about who they are or, you know, just their cultural identity or how they fit into the bigger message of what I'm trying to put out. So in a lot of ways, um, I think my work is shifting from just portraiture to more kind of telling a bigger story through portraiture. And a big part of, of your story that you want to tell does have to do with some very pertinent issues that we talk about in this program. Uh, right at the very top of it is race. Um, can you take us through that, how that has come from you, how that has emerged from you over the years? And we were talking before we went on the air about when you were a little kid, you were drawing when you were very young, but that, that transition from being someone who's just learning how to do something to finding ways of expressing and, and then seeing that expression on canvas in front of you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been a lifetime of experience, you know, as a black woman. I think it's it can't help but work itself into the work because it's a part of who I am. And that work is an expression of who I am. Even if it is portraiture of other people, I still think of it in some ways as self-portrait because it's it's a piece of who I am in a way, you know? Really? Yeah, a little bit. You know, the, the story that comes out is partially me. So the collection of work in a way is also a self-portrait even if it's somebody else that's interesting i've never i've never heard that description i mean people say like when it comes to novels especially early novels by a writer they're almost always bio, uh, autobiographical to a certain extent but i never i've never heard that though described uh, from a person's own work yeah I, well that's the way i feel about it i mean it, it's certainly not representing me you know, at my face, but I think there is that part of me that's trying to say something with the work. And so in that way, it is autobiographical. It's it's speaking about what's on my heart and what's on my mind. And, and the models are, it's super important that I tell a story about them, um, but it's also, I can't help but have a part of me in there too, you know? And when you say models, are, are you, so are you necessarily doing these magnificent portraits? The model is just, a, I want to say just a model, or is it a portrait about a, per a person specifically, and then you have them in your studio, or is it both? It's both. Um, sometimes it's more about that person in particular. I think the work that I'm making right now is it's it's definitely more of a mix this time. So now it's really bringing in more of that narrative that I'm trying to tell and sort of like working in a specific theme. Um, and I'm still trying to infuse it with the personality of that person, just like I can't help but put myself in there in a way. I can't help but put the personality of that model in a reflection of the interactions that we've had or like, you know, just something beautiful about their personality, I think always works itself into the work. The last couple of years, of course, uh, there has been so much in the news about race. Black Lives Matter here in Buffalo, of course, 514. How have those particular events or movements found their way into your work? Well, I think sometimes that kind of stuff really takes some time to, because I have to process it too. You know, it's it's working through the feelings, a lot of anger about it, a lot of frustration, sadness about it, even grief. And I think sometimes that takes a while to uh, show directly in the work, but it, it does process in the sense of it motivates me to create the work even more so and get the message out there and, you know, really flip some of these misconceptions upside down and tell the truth about like who black people are and like how diverse we are as people you know we come in every different shade we come from every different walk of life there's no putting us in one single box and I think when we see these terrible instances of violence and racism it just you know it, it discourages me but it also 
makes me realize that it's so important to keep doing this work and to, you know, do my little part in the visual arts to try to like change things. Do you find it therapeutic? Oh uh, yeah, there's definitely an aspect of that to it for me. Um, there's the frustration that comes first. I do a lot of journaling, uh, and I think that's where the frustration kind of comes out. Is a uh, verbal journal journaling or written? So I'll, like I'll write down, you know, just notes, things like that. Okay. Uh, just you know, thoughts on things, feelings. A lot of like really loose, free form reflections, and then over time, I kind of let that refine itself. And by the time I get to working on the paintings, I think that's where it's a lot more therapeutic. And it's me just getting into like this sort of meditative place almost when I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I, it, it you've really intrigued me about this. And I, I guess I'm trying to see if there's a way for you to describe to me how maybe a nuance to something that we're looking right around here at, in your studio right now that is, is an extension of those those notes that you're taking, those feelings that you have. I mean, can you maybe just try to d describe one instance like that? Uh, sure. I mean, well, this series that I'm working on now in the studio, uh, you can see a lot of hand gestures. Um, and that's a reflection of notes that I've been taking for a while now on just like representation in classical art and, you know, r the idea of religion and how, you know, black population, a lot of us have a very strong belief in God. I mean, some people don't, but there's certainly a, a portion of us that do. And I think about, you know, when we think about Christianity, what do we think of a lot of times? We think of this very Anglo-Saxon version of Jesus, and, you know, the, all these characters that are so whitewashed. And while certainly maybe they didn't look, you know, African, they, they certainly looked Middle Eastern. It, it's there. There's the truth about who these folks are. So you don't see melanin in those representations a lot of times. And I think that that's so significant because I wonder what that does to our our psychological state you know to have this thing that's so close to your heart and not have any sort of representation that you ever see around that around these figures so anyway the work is kind of a reflection of that not seeing ourselves in religion um not seeing ourselves in classical art on the walls you know all of these in my studio here i have reference photos of a lot of classical pieces uh that depict different scenes from the bible and you can see they're all <laughs> European. Right. So, you know, that, so we're missing, even aside from the religion, we're missing from the classical work as well. And I think it's important that a hundred years from now, that's not the case. That if, you know, black students walk into galleries, they see it as the norm. It's not an exception. And uh, it's, it, for me, I remember um, there was a painting at the Met that I saw, and this was maybe 10 years back now, I want to say. And it was such an emotional turning point for me because it was a black figure. And in, classical European art. And I was like, wow, this is so unique. And I haven't seen this before in person, something like this. And that shouldn't be the case, though. You know, it should be commonplace. We should see black figures depicted as something other than slaves and servants. And, you know, there should be this visual history of us and what we've done and who we are. It's interesting you should say it like that, because it does reflect um, at your website, you do have a, a couple of really, I think, strong statements in there. But one is, People of color have been trapped in someone else's narrative for too long. That's a big driving force for you. Yeah, because I think, you know, that there is a lie in that, in the sense of, like, being trapped in this narrative that's fabricated around your entire identity. You know, we weren't... Uh, I don't want to minimize um, slavery by any means, but I'm saying we weren't just slaves. You know, there were other things that we've been. We're inventors, there were doctors, lawyers. Uh, there's amazing accomplishments, astronauts. And I feel like the thing that we constantly see is like the victimization of us. We, we see that in the portrayals in art a lot of times. We see that in the requests from curators. Uh, it's, it's less about celebrating our accomplishments or just appreciating us for the beauty of how we look. I, I'd like to see that. A lot of classical art, when you do see black figures, they're just in the background. They're servants or, you know, they're like shadowy figures. And you don't see a lot of instances where it's just the person. It's just a celebration of who they are. You did say requests from curators, so that uh, that makes me curious. So uh, you see that I, we're talking to curators, we're talking about galleries and things along those lines. So that's still kind of the marketplace. There's a that element to art uh, that still exists. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, I'm fortunate in that I think that the people that I've worked with have not asked that of me. I, I've been really fortunate to do projects that celebrate like our accomplishments, but I see not every artist gets that. I, I see a lot of artists taking opportunities 
you know, because they have to a lot of times, but um, there are opportunities that don't necessarily focus on the good stuff. A lot of times it's it's stuff that's, how do I put this? I call it like trauma-centric work. Okay. And I think it's totally fine to create work about trauma um, if that's what the artist's desire is. I think if black artists are constantly asked to create work about slavery and about, uh, you know, racism from the 60s and stuff like that, I think if that's not what they want to do, they shouldn't be forced into saying, well, this is how you're going to make it, is if you, you know, do this sort of stuff. Uh, they should be allowed to express themselves. And this younger generation coming up, you know, now, I think they have a lot to say. And sometimes that work has nothing to do with race. And I think that they should be allowed that space if that's what they want to do. I like doing work that's about race. I think it's important and meaningful. But I think we have to think into the future again, 50, 100 years, and make sure that there's spaces for black artists that just want to create. Maybe they want to create about botanical art. Maybe they want to create about, you know, something completely separate from that. And I want them to have room to do that. I want to talk just a little bit about your background because you um, are from Buffalo. Buff State uh, was your, your, your college. Um, how has Buffalo influenced what we've been talking about here about how, like you said, this is race is a very important part of you as an artist, what you want to say as an artist at this time of your life. How has Buffalo influenced that? Well, I think my experience in Buffalo has been interesting. Um, I've lived a little bit all over Buffalo. You know, I was born on the east side. I moved out to the Sheridan Parkside Projects. I moved out to Cheektowaga. I moved to the west side. So I've lived all over Buffalo. And uh, I think seeing, you know, the various parts of it has made me aware of the really great things. You know, we were talking about that before. There's a lot of cool things happening here. But there's also division, you know. There's a lot of... Buffalo is one of those cities where the racial divide is so present you know it's so visible in some ways for all the wonderful things about us that's that's one of the things we really need a lot of work on i think and so i think um also you know coming from a mixed family my dad's greek and my mom's black my mom's from the south you know so i think it, we've been dealing with race my entire life uh, i've seen both sides of things the treatment when i've been out with my mixed race family the treatment when it's been me and my mom and, and you know it's it can't help but work its way into the work that you make. If you're making work that's really, I think, from your heart and about you, it works its way into that. You mentioned how that line of race exists so clearly here in Buffalo. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Are there spaces, though, where you find that that breaks down, that um, where it's more permeable, for lack of a better term, the, the line of race is, is I want to say, not existent but maybe it's it's a little easier space to be um, a black person inter uh, acting with uh, white people well I mean I will say here at BAS this is not just because I'm here in the studio it's not a shameless plug <laughs> I do uh, I do feel like this is a space that's very welcoming of black artists and very uh, just open to letting you have your message and you know, be a creative and express the way that you want to. But, you know, there are there are certainly spaces like that. And I think the spaces where you see people interacting the best are the ones where ego has been put aside, the sensitivity, you know, to hear maybe some uncomfortable truths has been aside, put aside. I think, you know, when we can do that, there's room to talk, you know, if, if people don't get too sensitive, you know, and can just kind of like hear you out and hear like, hey, this doesn't mean that you're a terrible person, but... There's work to be done, you know. Maybe you could you could be doing this better. Your organization could be doing this better. And I think when people are receptive to that, it creates an environment where change can happen. Do you think it's improving in Buffalo? Oof, that is a tough question. <laughs> I think in some ways I'm seeing improvement. I think uh, certainly in the arts, I feel like there's more opportunities for black artists. Uh, you know, I, I see a number of black artists on the rise. And I think the opportunities I've been given, I'm able to also try to like work with the youth and extend opportunities. So I think in that sense, I see some improvement. But then, you know, we have instances that set us back and you look and you say, man, have we made improvement on a larger scale? So I think it's it's a really hard question to answer. In some ways, yes. In a lot of ways, no. Jillian Hainsworth, the, the poet, um, she stated very dramatically uh, to me not long after 514 that, you know, 
Buffalo's east side, Buffalo's black community is where art comes from in this community. I mean, it was an emphatic statement, one that has stayed with me. How about for, for what you see? Do you see a, a creative, artistic community here? Maybe not, and, and, and to take it a step further, maybe not necessarily fully nurtured at this time. What are your thoughts about that? Like on on the east side, do is there? Yeah, well, oh, definitely. I mean, there's. I think that's where we really see a divide in resources. I'll say that. So we could just kind of touch on that a little bit. I think there's so much talent. There's so many talented black artists. I just did a showcase um, just like two months ago. I want to say now with Box Gallery, highlighting some up and coming artists. A lot of some some of them were known, but some of them had never really done anything yet. And it's like, how is this talent un unrecognized? And I think when you go into the East Side, you may find a ton of talent, but there's not the opportunities being extended. There, and maybe that's because some folks aren't necessarily getting into, you know, the same programs as somebody that's had resources all of their life, you know, to get into different programs, if that makes sense. Sure. You no, know? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So uh, there's a lot out there to yeah. still be found. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, those of us that are in the arts and do have some sort of influence or platform have to be mindful to like say, okay, where else in my community can I extend those opportunities and in what ways can I be of service to my community and sort of branch out and say, who are these other artists that maybe haven't gotten that platform yet and deserve a moment with that platform? Did you have a, a, a mentor or patriarch, uh, for lack of better terms, that uh, was, was like that for you maybe a little bit coming up? Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky that I've had a lot of great teachers, to be honest. Like, I, Carol Townsend over at Buff State's been a huge, you know, supporter and influence, uh, taught me to write my first grants. Candace Masters has been amazing over there. And, and you know, I, I've had a lot of really, really wonderful teachers. So, and of course, the ladies here at BAS have always been supportive. So it's been a lot of people rooting for me. So in that sense, I think that that's not the norm. You don't, we're, we're, we're lucky if we get one or two people on our side in life. So I feel so fortunate in that sense. I've had something that not a lot of people get the privilege of having. Looking back at origins a little bit, I mean, have there been, or maybe there still are, those artistic doubts that, ah, oh, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to make it. it have you had those, and what do you do to get through? I think I've always known that I'm going to be it. I was going to be an artist, and I think maybe for me that's because I'm not defining it on whether or not what my income is for the year. Like, I was an artist when I wasn't making income from it. I've, I'll be an artist if I can no longer make income from it because I'm going to continue to produce meaningful work, you know, that's coming from my heart. Um, but... I think that, yeah, when it, when it comes to making the work, we're always our own harshest critic, right? You know, it's a, you make stuff and you think it's, you know, possibly good, and then you go back to the drawing board, and it's like, oh, this is terrible. But I think it, I know when something's going to be good, and I feel like I know when something's not going to be good, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, I, I was talking about the meditative quality of painting, and I find and the older I get, the more I know the cues of when not to paint. Um, and there's like definitely in terms of moments or yeah 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 i think there's times for me to just go do something else even if i have a deadline coming up sometimes if i sit down and i paint and it's not the right headspace and i'm forcing it it'll turn out bad it doesn't matter how much work i put into it or how much i labor over it it will not be what i want it to be and i'll start over because i won't put it in something if i don't like it so there's definitely like those cues to myself that I'm not in the right headspace and I need to just go do some laundry, do something else <laughs> and then come back to it later, you know, I think. But that's a lesson I've learned as I've gotten older. Sure. I don't know, a lesson maybe others could, could utilize as well. Um, you're not just a painter, though, uh, and you have quite the sculpture project uh, on your plate right now. Tell us about it. Ah, it's it, well. So it's a sculpture of Shirley Chisholm. It's going to be uh, honoring her outside of her mausoleum at Forest Lawn. And uh, it's just such a huge honor. Like, I'm still kind of in shock some days. I wake up, I'm like, wow, I have this amazing project. Uh, but it's great because I feel like the it's really a crossover of skills. Like I had mentioned before, that I'm working in 2D with my paintings, but there's something about understanding depth that translates really well for sculpture. And I think I've been surprised at how natural it's felt in that respect, you know, just and how much fun it's been just to work with a material that's not the norm for me to, you know, work with my hands and see something take form in three dimensions. It's been really refreshing for me. And are you still finding that ability to put that nuance in that 
is expressive for you? Is, are you finding that? Yeah, I think a lot of that with this project came in sort of the early part of the work. So doing the sketch, uh, the final sketch that I did and the preliminary sketches, uh, doing the mock-up, the maquette that I did, a lot of that was kind of infusing the personality into it and making some of those creative decisions like, you know, what kind of pattern is going to be on her dress? What's the pose? What's the like subtlety in the way that her hand is tilted like that sort of thing you, you think about that in the early phases because i knew with this once i got to the big phase i didn't want to have to guess <laughs> right, so, right. yeah <laughs> right right what have you learned about shirley chisholm uh, through this process you probably have learned quite a bit i mean just an amazing woman i, I didn't realize that she was actually buried here in new york until right. in buffalo for that matter um until this project came about and just hearing like the people that have been on the panel hearing their stories about her and like what an amazing and woman she was we already knew she was amazing from history but just to hear you know their one-on-one -on -one stories I think has been really powerful because you think about big figures and you think about how disconnected they can feel but to have somebody have interacted with somebody personally is really incredible and I think we're so fortunate to have that here in Buffalo your murals you've done some really interesting murals including over the freedom wall um some legendary uh, historical figures like uh, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King, Gloria Parks, Eva Doyle. You did Eva Doyle. Uh, were you doing it from a picture, or you did, did you have her in front of you when you uh, when you're doing some of the work? When you're... I did it from a picture, uh, but it was great because Miss Doyle stopped by all the time. So it was, yeah. <laughs> so I got a chance to every time she stopped by, I'd take a little peek and look at it side by side and think, okay, I'm getting it. <laughs> But uh, that that one, I think knowing that she was going to see it, I think was a lot of pressure for me, too, because I'm like, it has to be right. It's got to be right. So, you know, that kind of spurred me on to make sure I did a really good job on that one. <laughs> I'm sure you did a fine job. But what about, uh, I'm interested about what your impressions of her were as you were doing your work. I mean, a wonderful woman, just, uh, you know, uh, somebody really uh, who values the history of Buffalo and preserving it and telling our stories, I think. That's exactly the type of person that I'm talking about when I'm saying we need to honor those legends. You know, we have to make sure that their story is told while they're preserving the stories of other people. So she, you know, a phenomenal woman and just uh, very supportive, too, I found when she came out. I, I really appreciated that. It's I'm sure she's busy. So oh, having yeah. her stop by and, you know. Yeah, she's busy. I try. She puts me on hold all the time. So, yeah, she's definitely busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Arthur Eve, you also uh, did uh, uh, a mural of Arthur Eve as well, and talk about a legend, most certainly as a legend. And yeah, well, he actually came to the Freedom Wall um, opening as well, which was phenomenal to me uh, to get to meet this person physically as well. That's it goes back to that thing with Miss Eva Doyle. It's like wow, we have these legends, and I get to like see them in person and shake their hand and meet them. So I think um, the thing that stood out the most to me about him was seeing the way people flock to him at the opening and the impact that he had had because there were people, you know, just surrounding him and people with gratitude, people, you know, thank you for everything you've done. And it's, it, to me, that's such a beautiful thing to know that people were still honoring him for the work that he did because the work that he did still echoes today. <laughs> it's, it's important and relevant to us today. So have also done murals outside the city of Buffalo. Cincinnati, is that, the, did I see that? Yeah, the Mammy Smith uh, mural I did there. So that was... um pretty cool one because that worked with uh students so they actually got up on the scaffolding and I, I worked with them as well and but a lot of it was there actually putting the paint on the wall so like that was pretty cool to me to see them you know learning on the job and just how talented they were that was it's always students always amaze me with what they're capable of you know I wish I had the talent that a lot of them have when I was at that age you know I had the interest but not always necessarily that technical ability and I don't know if it's because kids have access to the internet now and all of these, you know, masterclass tutorials right at their fingertips, but right. I think they take full advantage of it, which is really a great thing to see. So you've done quite a few murals I mean, people of, of history or, or legends. Um, any that you might want to still do? Good question. Well, I always say I would like to do one of Ruby Bridges. I think that'd be cool. And I've had this idea for a while about the Ruby Bridges one, but I think it'd be cool to maybe do Ruby Bridges with like a contemporary like child as well. And just to kind of like bring that modern element to it. Um, but I mean, there Mae Jemison, I, I know she was supposed to come to Buffalo actually at one point, I think last year. And uh, I was hoping maybe I could like, hey, <laughs> could I get in there and just get an interview, snap a couple shots? But uh, it, it didn't end up getting canceled, I think, in the end. So 
another thing I saw on Instagram that I thought was uh, curious. You, you have a one of your paintings, and it's not complete. It's half complete, and underneath it, you say, "I wish they could stay like this." Yeah. Well, <laughs> explain that thought. I just love that in between process. I mean, I don't know if it's because I just love the figure so much, and I do think there's something to be said for you know the pieces I have here in the studio that have you know, the hands fully complete, like very lifelike and the face fully complete. And then there's just this empty kind of space where, you know, maybe a, a wrist cuff is or like a, a drapery, something like that. There's something interesting about that to me, the contrast between this really refined portion of it and this completely flat surface as well. So I, I'm thinking that's more of an aesthetic sort of artistic exploration for me to look into. Um, but I, I'm curious what it says I guess on an emotional level as well. And that's something I think I have to journal more and figure out what it's saying to me. Talk about that process, because I said that you, you caught me, uh, I was about ready to wrap up with a couple of questions here, but when you say, when you talk about, you know, want to journalize it more and and look look it through it, just, if you can, try to explain that process to, to us, how that all connects for you as you move forward. Yeah, well, I, I think I had mentioned earlier, the journaling for me is where, the thoughts can just be free form. I don't have to put any rhyme or reason to them. I can just say what's on my mind, you know? And I think there needs to be a space for that. And then I refine it. You know, maybe that first journal entry is kind of chaotic and hectic and emotional. And then the next one, I'm taking one piece from that that really stuck with me and I'm refining it, reflecting a little bit more on that. Uh, maybe in the next one, I'm refining it even more and bringing in some outside information. Maybe I heard something in a video clip or I read something that ties into it. You know, I, I, I believe in, in some ways kind of like looking for signs around you too, you know, like, uh, just seeing how like things connect. And sometimes I feel like that happens, you know, with the work that I'm working on and the journaling that I'm doing, I'll see something that feels like it connects to that. And I try to refine that. That sounds, I don't know, I feel like that sounds confusing, but. No, no. I, I mean, I, I understand. I think what you're trying to express there, there's, there's something that's, not really necessarily easy to uh, describe in a concrete way, but there's definitely things that come through, whether it's your intuition or your instinct or... Yeah, your intuition. I mean, I'm sure people have all, all different takes, the universe, and God, <laughs> spirituality. I mean, I think I'm a very spiritual person, and, you know, I think that intuition is a part of that, too. So I think those things kind of feel like they connect for me sometimes and work their way into the final piece. As we are winding down here, one of the questions we do like to ask um, our guests on this show, because it's called Buffalo, What's Next? What does Buffalo need? You can take that from any way you want, but just when it, when you hear that, that question, what comes to your mind? I think the first thing I think is Buffalo needs stewardship of its resources. Good, better stewardship in some ways. I think that we have so much here. You know, we're not a poor place. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of, like, things that we could offer to one another. And I think if we could really take time to think about what each of us has, you know, whether you're an executive at a bank or something, or if you're, you know, a person like me who's just an artist, I think we need to each think about what we have to contribute and how we can invest that in the betterment of the Buffalo community and like within our own individual communities. Like I was saying with the East Side, we need to look at that. That's a part of Buffalo. I think there are people that certainly want to pretend like it's not and say, oh, well, you know, Buffalo Renaissance, downtown waterfront. But it's a part of Buffalo just as much as the waterfront and uh, just as much as the Elmwood Village. And if we ignore it, not only is it wrong on like a human to human level, but we're missing out as Buffalonians. We can't sit here and get excited about like rallying around the bills and everything and then just like ignore our neighbors and ignore food deserts and, you know, pretend like that's the ugly part of things that we just want to sweep away. We have to think about the stewardship of what we have. And that will do it for today's Summertime Producer Picks episode. We would like to thank our guests, Itina Faree Cook, A Cool Men's I Do, and Julia Bottoms. If you missed this and you'd like to hear it again, a reminder, this program is a podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast or the Amplify BTPM app. And each episode is also online on demand at WBFO.org. This is WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOL and Olean, and WBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. This is Charles Gilbert. Thanks for listening. 